say a word about our guest, uh, Nigel Scheinwald. He is without, without any question one of the most experienced and one of the most respected diplomats in the world today. He's a great friend of our country and he's had an extraordinary career. Before he was ambassador to the United States, he was the foreign and defense policy advisor to Prime Minister Tony Blair during the critical years 2003 to 2007 at 10 Downing Street. Prior to that, he was the UK's uh, Her Majesty's ambassador to the European Union in Brussels. Prior to that, in charge of European affairs at the Foreign Office, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in London. He was press secretary for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. That's where we got to know each other when I was State Department spokesman during the Clinton administration. And in the early part of his career, he served in both Moscow at the height of Soviet power and in Washington at maybe the height of American power during President Reagan's presidency. So he's someone who can look back with us over 30 years to appreciate where we've come from, but also we want to look ahead in this session and then go to your questions in the last 15 or 20 minutes and your thoughts for Nigel. So my first question, and we have rehearsed this by the way, because we're <laughs> friends. My first question maybe would be to ask you, Nigel, your motivations for becoming a diplomat. You obviously, you're educated at Harrow and at Oxford. You must have had, you're too modest to say, lots of options, business, <coughs> journalism, perhaps politics. You chose diplomacy. I'd like to ask you why. Is it because um, you wanted to be in the arena? That Theodore Roosevelt, when he left the presidency, gave a famous speech at the Sorbonne in, in 1910 saying, the credit belongs to the person, he said man, person <laughs> in the arena who accepts the weighty responsibilities of public office, who serves the public good. Was that a motivation when you were a young person? It, it, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I was very uncertain as I was leaving university what I wanted to do. I did not have a vocation or, or didn't think I had for this. It, was, it wasn't entirely accidental. But if I'd done anything which had been a link from what I'd done at university, it would have been going into the theatre or going into journalism. That was what I was interested in at the time. And I chose maybe for cowardly reasons not to, not to do either of those. But I think there were three things. I mean, I was interested in public service. That certainly um, attracted me. It, it attracted me to be working for the government. Uh, I thought that was a big stage, um, potentially, to be, um, to be working on. Uh, secondly, I was always one of those people who'd been uh, drawn, when you're reading a newspaper, to the international pages. Um, I, you know, in my uh, years as a teenager and at university, um, there was a lot going on. There was a lot going on in the Middle East. There was a lot going on in Greece, as there is today. And we had the, the coup of the colonels uh, uh, in those days. Um, so I was drawn to international politics, um, um, probably rather more than to, um, to national politics uh, at, that, um, uh, at that stage. Um, and I suppose one of the things I learned from my otherwise not terribly useful subject, which I studied at university, which was classical languages, uh, literature, uh, and history, um, was I liked political analysis. And, and I thought that would stand me in reasonably good stead for, um, for, for a career in, uh, in the Foreign Service, although I must say my first job uh, in Japan, I spent too much time trying to analyze Japanese politics in terms of the Roman, uh, Roman Empire, which didn't go down very well um, <laughs> with anyone that I was, uh, I was working with. So it, wa it wasn't really something that I thought I was you know, doomed or fated uh, to do. It was one of a number of things that, um, that, I, uh, that I applied for and I, and I got this. Good. So you joined the diplomatic service and in the early part of your career, you served in these two great capitals of the the great powers during the bipolar era of the Cold War. What was it like to be in Moscow as a young officer? And did you, was it possible to see in the late 70s, you were there during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, in the Brezhnev era, that that empire would collapse by 1991? Was it, looking back on it, one can see why the Soviet Union weakened, but it wasn't apparent then, or was it? No, it wasn't to me. I mean, I think there were you know, a small number of people, um, probably here, probably in the UK, who were predicting that. Um, I certainly didn't. If it wasn't the way it appeared to me, I was in Moscow in 78, 79. Brezhnev was still in charge. It seemed a very solid, um, a very permanent sort of structure, not without its obvious faults. The economy was plainly weak. We didn't realize how weak. Um, the, the military and intelligence structure of the Soviet Union seemed very strong. We didn't um, realize the, the, the vulnerabilities, which became apparent um, as, it, um, uh, as it broke up. And I don't think people at the, you know, most people at the time 
thought that this was going to be around for some time. I remember when Margaret Thatcher first met uh, Gorbachev, I think in 1984, before he became the, uh, the General Secretary, and when she said, uh, I like Mr. Gorbachev, um, uh, we, can do, we can do business uh, with him. Uh, she talked about how firmly each of them believed in their, their own system. There was no sense at that stage that the system that Gorbachev uh, represented was going to uh, collapse, uh, collapse uh, imminently. And I think you have to give Gorbachev himself a fair amount of credit um, for changing things quickly uh, in the Soviet Union and starting a process which he probably didn't realize uh, the end of, um, given that he did not properly understand um, uh, uh, capitalism and uh, the economic forces on our side, but did understand the need for a fundamental political change and, and renewal. And that's what got things going um, in, the, uh, in the 1980s, combined with the very clear um, um, confrontation which, he, which, uh, which Gorbachev um, uh, came to see from the United States, from NATO, and from others, which forced out, forced, uh, forced out the sort of weaknesses which, um, uh, which led ultimately to the collapse of the, Soviet, of the Soviet Empire. And the oil price going down, of, of course, in the 80s had quite a big impact on the Soviet economy as well. So we can, we can look back with perfect 2020 hindsight and see how the Soviet Union was weakening economically, certainly in the 80s. You then move to Washington, to Ronald Reagan's Washington, and we can look back and see how that country, our country, was strengthening in the 1980s. The big defense buildup of President Reagan, the self-confidence that President Reagan gave back to the American people about who we were. What was it like to be um, on the point with the British Embassy, working with that administration? And is the United States sometimes a difficult and troublesome ally? <laughs> I'm not trying to get you into trouble here as a serving diplomat. Well, I mean, the, now and then. the first thing to say is how different it was just as a place to work. I mean, I, um, when, you know, as, as a foreign diplomat in Moscow, um, uh, all my understanding of Roman politics became very, very useful indeed because you, you did Soviet politics the old way. You did it according to who was standing where um, on the, uh, in, the, in the photographs, whether someone was moving up or down in the pecking order. You searched for every single word. It was like literary criticism. You watched every single word for signs of greater warmth or, or coldness. It was a, you know, a highly developed form of, uh, of literary criticism from some distance. And in those days, Soviet officials really didn't give very much away. It was a very arid sort of diplomacy that we were conducting. Um, and coming here and doing what I did, I was, I was the person in the embassy doing American domestic politics, so I watched the 1984 campaign, not maybe one of the most exciting, but certainly very exciting from the outside, trying to get into, uh, um, uh, getting, getting into that. Um, having access to people who are prepared to talk to you and sometimes tell you a little bit too clearly what they thought um, about um, what was going on. That, for a young diplomat, was extremely invigorating. Uh, Moscow was just, was just different. It was something which was, uh, um, uh, it was fascinating in some ways, but ultimately um, it wasn't what diplomacy uh, was about, which has got to involve some uh, exchange, some negotiation, some ability to influence the other, the other person, which was very rare in my case uh, uh, in Moscow. And you're right, the mood was one, you know, mainly one of confidence uh, after Vietnam, of having a very confident leader, having a very, very clear set of policies and successful ones over the course of that decade in relation to the Soviet Union, which was the main thing. But it wasn't as though there weren't some problems along the way. And uh, um, you know, observing um, the, uh, the, the, the death of the Marines in, uh, in Lebanon and the aftermath of that, observing the Iran-Contra scandal later in the... Uh, later in the decade, you know, no phase of American foreign policy that I've seen has been without its setbacks and without its, uh, without its difficulties. It was a fairly barren period, as far as I recall, in relation to the Middle East peace process as well. So it wasn't as though everything was going right. The central theme of confrontation with the Soviet Union and seeing the weakening of the Soviet Union, that was a huge success um, for, for the president and for um, his, uh, his NATO allies. But other things proved um, incredibly problematic. And even in a relationship which was incredibly close between the UK and the US at that stage with Margaret Thatcher and, uh, and Ronald Reagan, a great personal and ideological uh, affinity between them, there were problems. There are always problems between Britain and America on trade issues. Uh, we had the West Siberian gas pipeline where the United States wanted in that stage to stop all European companies getting involved in a pipeline from, uh, from the Soviet Union to Western Europe. 
And we didn't disagree on the politics. What we disagreed with is our companies being directed uh, from Washington. That is one of the old American viruses of extraterritoriality, which we don't like. Don't, didn't like then, don't like it now. Um, we didn't terribly like it when an island, um, the head of state of which was uh, Her Majesty the Queen, uh, Grenada, was, um, was invaded by the United States in 1983. Um, again, um, we can sort of understand the reasoning, which was to do with Cuba and to do with the perceived um, um, spread of communism in the, uh, in the Caribbean. Um, but maybe someone should have, um, you know, telephoned ahead. Um, <laughs> you know, so not the most elegant handling of, um, of a very close, uh, of a very close ally. Apologies. You know, no, no, no. We got, five years We later. got over it. We got over <laughs> it. Um, and uh, no, one of the things I was dealing with was Northern Ireland, um, a difficult subject um, in the United States, dealing with it with the administration, with the Congress, with uh, Irish Americans around the country. Things were changing here, but it was still a, a, a period where a, a lot of Americans, uh, too many Americans, were supporting the IRA, either, um, either through sympathy or, um, in the case of um, direct funding, through NORAID and other, and other organizations. And that was a source of real concern to us, which gradually changed. And uh, um, uh, as the British and Irish government started to work more closely together in the 80s, and particularly in the 90s, that was turned into a real positive as the United States and the Irish American community here really helped us to create the breakthroughs which we saw in the 1990s. That wouldn't have happened without America and without Irish America. But when I was doing it 10 years before, um, you know, that, was a, that was a tough period. Yeah. Um, I think if you asked most American diplomats in 2011 which country is our closest ally, the great majority would say still it's Britain. For lots of different historical reasons, also because of the fact that we have very close strategic interests globally. Um, and there is a special relationship. I told Nigel this morning, I was in London and gave a speech at the LSC, London School of Economics, last summer. And I very innocently and sincerely said, I was a great supporter of the special relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States. All these hands went up. There is no special, these are left-wing professors. There is no special relationship. We're down with a special relationship. Is there a special <laughs> relationship? <laughs> Well, I, I think there is as long as you, you're careful about defining your terms and don't sound smug or complacent. It's not like Churchill and Roosevelt um, bestriding the world and being able to um, determine uh, world events in the way, in many ways, that they, that they were able to. Our power, UK power, has declined uh, relatively um, over that period. Your power has declined relatively over that period. And we can't um, pretend to uh, organize world affairs in the way that uh, we might have um, tried to certainly during the during the um, uh, the Second World War, but um, all that said, um, what is unusual about our relationship are um, a few things. First of all, um, the depths of those personal, cultural, and values-based uh, links. We don't have we don't we tend to be on both on the same sides of the really big questions, um, just by instinct and by um, and by habit. And there are there are these extraordinary human links backwards and forwards. Our economic relationship gets, you know, inevitably uh, overlooked. People are, people are rightly interested, as we are in the UK, in China, India, and the rest. But the truth is that the UK and US are each other's biggest investors by quite a long way. Um, British investment here is over 500 times Chinese investment in the United States. It will take decades to change that fundamental degree of economic integration that my country has here and your country has um, in the UK. Um, and lastly, on the, on the security and intelligence side, we just have a very, very long um, tradition of working incredibly closely together, um, uh, remaining, in the UK's case, um, a, a potent ally of the United States. For all the talk about cutbacks which we've had to make, uh, we will remain the fourth largest uh, military uh, power in the world with a, with a budget uh, over 2%, which is the NATO requirement. Um, and we are prepared to put our forces where necessary in harm's way, as we do at the moment in Afghanistan, where our people are um, in the toughest part of the, uh, of the fight. So that willingness to have capabilities, to expend the money on that, and then be prepared to share the sacrifice is something which we're not alone in the world in, uh, in doing. Um, but, um, but that is something which makes us, I think, um, useful, useful allies. The US has other special relationships. Um, it has you know, a special relationship with Israel and Ireland and um, uh, Canada and Mexico. They're all a bit different. 
the UK-US one, uh, particularly in the area of foreign policy, relies on the candor of our, uh, of our dialogue, and it relies on the fact that we are, we are both prepared um, to project our views and our values um, um, internationally when necessary. Um, that's, I think, what the basis of it is. I think it's also important to note in this uh, largely American audience, um, Bob Gates, who just stepped down on Friday as a just terrific Secretary of Defense for our country, gave a blistering speech uh, criticizing the NATO allies for their lack of defense preparedness and lack of capacity and lack of defense spending just a couple of weeks ago. But really, Britain is an exception to that. Britain is spending well above what all the other European allies are spending. Britain is the only member of the alliance, in my judgment, that has a global capacity to act militarily, as does the US. And I wanted to ask about 9-11. Since 9-11, Britain went into Afghanistan with us on October 7th of 2001 as we invaded. And Britain, of course, was with us in the Iraq War. We're just about to commemorate a, a tragic day in American history, September 11th, 2001, the 10th anniversary, it's hard to believe. It's been an unusual decade since. Britain and America find ourselves in two major land wars in the greater Middle East, in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and now in a intervention in Libya, which at best has been inconclusive, merely a stalemate. Um, how do you, what are your reflections as a serving diplomat on what we've been through, particularly the emphasis we put on security, which of course was important after 9-11, what's that done to our societies in terms of, terms of some of the arguments we've had about how we acquit ourselves in the so-called war on terror? Just your thoughts on that I think would be of great interest to us. Well, I think the, um, the, the, the two wars, um, really from the start, were pretty different. Um, in Afghanistan, there really wasn't a fundamental issue amongst ourselves of legitimacy. We had that legitimacy within, within the alliance, uh, with the UN, uh, for what we were doing in the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, of, uh, of and there was always um, a very large international coalition uh, involved, in, uh, involved in Afghanistan. Um, the problems there um, were more of um, um, having an uneven um, application of our, of our effort to Afghanistan over that 10-year um, ten ten year period. We had um, a very uh, rapid victory in uh, 2001 itself, um, followed by a period in which quietly, obviously, the, um, the, the Taliban were able to regroup as we ourselves became more ambitious about how NATO could begin to cover more of the country than it had in that very early phase where it really concentrated just on Kabul. Um, and I don't think we understood the, the problem um, of dealing with an insurgency um, with a neighboring country providing safe haven. That is an unusual state of affairs in the history of counterinsurgency, uh, and it is one of the key determinants of the, um, of the, of the, um, uh, the, problem, uh, the problem today. But I think the fact that we achieved victory relatively quickly um, in uh, Afghanistan uh, your special forces, some air um, forces, um, plus the Northern Alliance. Campaign. It was a brilliant military campaign. And it followed a decade in which, although there were difficulties, by and large, um, the United States and its allies got their way in, re in relatively short um, periods of combat. The, the first Iraq war in, two, in, uh, in 1991, um, the Balkans, for us um, in, Sierra, in Sierra Leone, um, it may be created um, the sense that these wars could be over quite quickly um, and that um, it would be a fairly straightforward thing then to transition to something else. We realized over time in Afghanistan that that was not the case, but we certainly realized, and this is the, this is the Iraq paradigm, that we were not prepared um, for what followed the, that successful military invasion in Iraq. There was no plan for, uh, effective plan certainly for the day after, um, and um, just on a point of fact, I started working for Prime Minister Blair in the summer of 2003, so uh, a few months after the actual invasion, um, just, uh, just after actually the, the bombing of the, the UN office in, uh, in yeah. Baghdad. Um, and at, I would say at no point from then until after the surge in 2007 um, did we regain control over security or, or, or over events. We were always running to catch up. With, um, with the pace of, um, I suppose, politics, but actually just the upheaval and the degree of opposition which we faced in, um, in Iraq itself. And at the same time, we're tethered to an incredibly slow transition process, which didn't deliver uh, a, sov a fully sovereign government in Iraq until 
uh, until the, the spring, summer of 2006. So we had three years of holding the baby um, in a very, very difficult way. So there are some obvious lessons there about um, the need to prepare for the fact that uh, wars do not go according to plan. Uh, you need the flexibility to be able to alter your uh, disposition on the battlefield. You need um, a, a complex strategy um, of politics and economics to deal with the, to deal with the peace. Um, and I think we've learnt those lessons. And I think, not, well, maybe not learnt them because, uh, uh, completely, but we've, we've understood them very, very much better. Um, and you mentioned Libya. Um, Libya, we don't know how that will go. I think I'm, you know, my government believes that we, we have time on our side. I can't predict when Gaddafi will go, but we believe that, um, that he is uh, weakening and will continue to weaken over time. But that the two things which definitely have helped us in Libya are, number one, the degree of regional support, which we had from the start, which, frankly, without that, it's very unlikely we would have, we would have been able to take the military action we took. So get the Arab League actually asking the international community to do something. And secondly, the very solid basis of UN uh, authorization for the use of military force, which from the start was, 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 um, was not explicitly there in relation to Iraq. There was a great debate, you know, about the legality of action and the legitimacy of action uh, in, uh, in Iraq. So we've now set the bar higher for um, any large-scale military uh, intervention internationally, but Bob Gates himself, I think, um, in, uh, in an earlier speech, yeah. um, said that he could not foresee that sort of large-scale military occupation being undertaken by the United States in the, um, in the decade ahead. Impossible to predict that. But you can see that, that it's going to take a lot more thought and care um, before countries like your and mine are going to undertake that sort of huge military occupation um, that we undertook in first uh, Afghanistan and then, and then Iraq. Nigel, you and I were both serving diplomats um, in 2001 and three when our governments made the decision to go into these two countries, Afghanistan and Iraq. You cannot wind back the reel. We cannot do that. But we also have to try to learn from our successes as well as our mistakes. Is there anything you can see now that you think the UA UK and US might have done differently? You've alluded to some of them. Uh, do you think we were right to intervene in both places? Was it more? the occupation of both countries where we found problems rather than the military interventions themselves? I think that um, in, in the case of Afghanistan, I think there was a widespread understanding, it probably still is, of why, um, of why it was reasonable um, and proportionate to intervene, given that that was the, uh, the base from which those 9-11 attacks were, were launched. And it's reasonable for your security and our country's security to try to avoid that situation uh, recurring. With Iraq, I think you're in so much more difficult situation because plainly, um, had we known then what we know now, and had we known then that Iraq did not have those weapons of mass destruction, certainly in the case of my country, there's absolutely no chance that there would have been any military involvement by the UK. Um, we, couldn't, we, we could not have gone in simply to change the, uh, to change the regime. Um, so it's difficult to argue these things with, with that um, degree of hindsight um, um, before you even get into the question of whether the um, uh, whether a positive outcome in Iraq, which isn't either to be taken for granted or excluded, um, would justify the loss of life in Iraq and, um, and, for both our, um, and for both our countries. There's a wider point, which um, I, I just want to mention. Um, uh, after 9-11 uh, here, um, uh, the US administration and maybe the public at, um, at large embraced the concept of a global war uh, on terror. Um, and uh, um, your generals had the term the long war, a war which would continue against uh, uh, radicalism and uh, um, an extreme um, Islam um, for maybe a, gen maybe a generation. And one could see why, uh, obviously having 9-11, having that terrible shock and the horror of losing thousands of people, um, in inevitably um, creates a great jolt. But um, I think particularly now, looking back, uh, one can see some of the disadvantages of, um, of using that sort of terminology and getting into that mindset. I mean, first of all, um, Al-Qaeda, for, for all its ability to cause uh, mayhem in that way, is not a threat to our society uh, in the long run. We are much bigger than they are. Um, your society, society in the UK, society uh, around the world, our economies and our societies and our politics are just much bigger than that. And there's no way whatsoever that Al-Qaeda could ever um, have brought our societies uh, down. Existential threat. 
po or pose an existential threat to us. I just um, uh, did not believe that, don't believe it, certainly don't believe it now. Um, and I don't think we should have given them the sort of um, the benefit um, of, um, of sort of um, giving them uh, almost um, equalizing um, them uh, with us, because I think that's exactly what they, what they wanted. I think also um, uh, in, the, uh, in the Muslim world, although we tried very hard to make this distinction, um, um, th the language, the, the martial language inevitably made it feel as if there was a war on, uh, on Islam, or at least parts of it, which made our task very, very much more difficult. So uh, one of our best British academics and historians said the right way to approach this <coughs> is to show sort of tactical respect for Al-Qaeda in the sense that you've got to treat them as a serious uh, enemy day by day, hunt them down, use your best intelligence, use your best military and police methods to, to deal with them. But ultimately, show them strategic disdain. They, they can't ultimately affect us. Uh, now in Britain, um, I say we're lucky, it's not quite the right phrase, but we've become resilient about um, attacks uh, in our own territory. We had a lot of them um, from the IRA. Uh, we say to people today, another attack on us is highly likely. That's the language we use. The threat in the UK is severe, another attack is highly likely. If there is another attack in the UK, people will not say that the House of Cards is gonna fall down. It's another attack, we'll have to deal with it. And I think here, um, uh, obviously, people here, people around the world are delighted you haven't had another attack since 9-11, although you know, people have got fairly close. Um, uh, of course it would be terrible if people lost their lives, but it will not be the end of the world. It will not be the end of America. And building up that sense of resilience among your politicians, among the public, is, I think, quite important. Um, and particularly watching al-Qaeda now, seeing the death of Osama bin Laden, seeing the way that al-Qaeda has not been part of the picture um, in, these, uh, um, in these revolutions and in these movements around the Arab world. I don't want to preempt your next talk or the expertise of, your, uh, of our colleague, but, um, but that shows that um, uh, this 10-year march has not been one which has brought al-Qaeda into the hearts of people around the, around the Muslim world. And I think we should have got that a little bit earlier. Good, and I'm sure some people might want to ask you about those comments. They're very important, I think, for our own country as, as well as yours. Before we go to questions, I wanted to pose to you, Nigel, just three very quick questions. They're difficult. About the future, as we look ahead, based on your experience as a diplomat, and the first has to do with our country, my country. You know, you're a longtime observer of the United States. A lot of people, it's very fashionable to say, a lot of people are saying the United States is in retreat. China's rising. China's going to eclipse the United States. I don't buy that line of argumentation. Do you, and, and the question is, 30 years from now, will the United States still be the strongest global power in military, political, economic uh, terms? Uh, I don't buy it. Um, I think that after the decade we've had, which has been uh, exceptionally difficult, I mean, uh, um, <laughs> without using any, any more uh, colorful uh, a phrase, it's been a, a very, very difficult decade for the United States and for the West uh, generally, not just because of these two very, very difficult wars, but also because of the, um, because of the financial crisis um, um, uh, and because of the, the impact of terrorism and the amount of money we've had to spend to protect, our, protect ourselves against that. So it's been a very difficult decade, and I think it, it's inevitable um, that at the end of this period, there should be some reflection. There is here, there is in the UK, there is elsewhere um, in Western Europe. Um, just about um, uh, how you want to project yourself in the world uh, in the future, what risks you want to take, and so on. I think that's almost unavoidable, uh, and unavoidable that there should be just a little bit of retrenchment um, and a greater care, as I was saying, about setting the bar at the right point for future, for future uh, interventions. But I think that, has, um, that there are some additional points here. It's striking in the opinion polls um, that people here um, believe that China is already a much more powerful economic power yeah. than it actually is. Um, and um, I think arising from that um, are starting to get a little bit panicky about the, um, uh, the real power of the United States in the world. And uh, I believe, as I think you do, Nick, that um, this, uh, this case is exaggerated. Um, Joe Nye, um, your colleague at, uh, at Harvard, um, has written very eloquently about this and said, ba you know, the essential point is that the case for American decline is at the very, very best um, uh, premature. There are so many factors which still play well for the United States 
um, in the global game. Um, looking at China, Ch China uh, economic power has certainly shifted, will continue to shift um, from west to east. But to um, translate that in a linear way to the use of political and military power um, is wrong. It's probably right that um, big economic powers are going to want to project themselves in some way uh, internationally. But China has a long, long way to go to make itself uh, a regional power, um, let alone um, a genuinely international player, a global player in the way that the United States is. And one of the reasons for that is that around China, are a lot of very potent um, American allies. And part of the, as I perceive it anyway, the current administration's strategy of, um, uh, of sustaining this strategic relationship with, uh, with India, which you did so much to uh, create and is one of the real changes, positive changes of the last, um, of the last uh, decade, uh, as well as working with Japan, South Korea, uh, Australia, um, uh, Singapore, the other you know, strategically placed countries in the Asia-Pacific region. That does not create a, a benign environment for China to just push out its power um, uncritically or without, without any, any check. It's a different, uh, it's, it, even if it wanted to, and I think that that is itself um, subject to some, to some debate because I would guess for the next decade uh, the requirement in China will continue to be the consolidation of their economic power which will impose some constraint on the amount of risk they're prepared to take in the way that they, um, that they project themselves internationally. And you still have great you know, economic strengths, which we've heard a lot about, the Aspen debates over the past, um, the past few days. Your higher education system remains the best in the world and will be the best in the world over that 30-year period. I have no doubt about that, Chinese and Indian universities notwithstanding. Um, your capacity for productivity and innovation remain incredibly high by, um, by um, global standards. Um, and I think your, your alliances, although they, again, they get a bit neglected in the, um, in the, um, uh, in the debate at the moment, they are great um, uh, virtues and benefits to the United States. China doesn't have alliances of the kind the United States does. Um, uh, alliances magnify your influence and your, and your reach. If you use them properly, uh, give people time, consult people, uh, put coalitions together, they give you very, very much more than just acting, just acting alone. And that's what worried me a little bit about, the, about um, Secretary Gates' speech, um, apart from um, not making clear how much the UK was putting into things. Of course, I would have preferred a nice UK paragraph in his speech. <laughs> but generally, I would have, I would have um, and, I, and we, of course, as a country, sympathize with the fact that, um, that NATO some NATO countries should have put much more into, um, into Afghanistan than they have and put much more into their military budgets. But at the back of this, um, NATO and, um, and other American um, um, uh, alliance relationships shouldn't be a matter of take it or leave it to the United States. I don't believe that's his personal view, but I think he was worrying about a position in which American politics turns to that view. Um, and I would say it's in America's interests to have, these, uh, to have these alliances. These redound to your credit and value and utility uh, internationally. They're, they're not just sort of little baubles which, um, which make America look good. They're very useful in the world that you're coming into where your um, supremacy will be challenged at least to some degree. Um, you've given us so much to think about and I can't resist two quick questions based on what you've just said. There was a great New Yorker piece uh, two months ago by a journalist named Ryan Lizza who yes. followed Secretary Clinton around. And one of the Clinton officials with her said on background, so he was not identified, he or she by name, said, the basic strategic problem of the United States is that we're over-invested in the Middle East and under-invested in Asia. And that the Obama administration is desperately trying to focus on Asia but is tied down by the two and a half wars. Is that correct? Well, we're all, we're all investing more in Asia, and we're doing it too. I mean, we're putting a lot of extra diplomatic um, aid effort into Pakistan. Um, uh, we're putting diplomatic effort into India and China, opening up in places we've never had before. We're all doing that. But um, if I look at the, the period ahead, the decade ahead or the decades ahead, um, I don't think America will have the luxury um, of only being able to deal with, with one theater, with one, with one set of threats. I mean, it's obviously much easier for you to say our world is now all about China, just as it was all about um, the Soviet Union in the, 19, um, in, in the immediate co you know, Cold War period. I'm afraid it's not going to be like that. And I don't know whether this comment was one before or after we saw the Arab Spring, but 
um, I would have thought that during. The, 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 during. Yeah. Well, then I would say um, that you know the um, the events which began in January of this year are going to take uh, a decade and probably decades to unfold. That American interests are um, vitally engaged, both in terms of your economic interests, but also your political and values interests. Uh, I don't think those are things that are that any sensible American administration would want to uh, leave behind. Um, and you know, I think therefore that the United States is going to continue to have to um, uh, to be an important player uh, in the Middle East as well as uh, in relation to China and in, in relation to the Asia Pacific. Uh, that doesn't mean we have to keep on fighting um, you know, um, very large wars with very large numbers of uh, forces tied down, uh, tied down on the ground. At $100 billion a year. At $100 billion a year. We mustn't, I think, renounce for all time the need to do that because um, you know, um, I, I think a, a great power like the United States may have, a, may have another need in some, some future point to invest its effort in that way. As I say, the bar has got higher for now. Um, but you're going to need to use your, uh, your military power, your economic power, your political power um, in a number of different theatres, I think, in the, um, in the period ahead, and hopefully um, be able to transport, transfer resources um, that are saved and not having um, such expensive commitments in Iraq and Afghanistan by the end of this decade. I think a lot of us recognize in our own country that our big battle is going to be our budget and getting our economic house in order so that we can afford to be a global power in the future. I imagine Europeans worry about the same thing. I mean, you must be relieved, Prime Minister Cameron must be relieved every morning when he wakes up that you didn't join the Eurozone. <laughs> We've seen this uh, <laughs> smart decision. We've seen Europe is in crisis. The Greek crisis, potential crises in Ireland, in Portugal, in Spain, lead some to believe, the pessimists, that the idea of an ever-expanding, ever-strengthening European Union is really at risk. How serious is this Euro debt crisis that, we all, that we're all reading about? Well, I think it is serious. I mean, I, um, th there, there's no foreseeable prospect of us going into the Euro. I think that's, I think that's a very good Nick Burns yes. prediction. Um, uh, and, um, but it wasn't just that. I mean, our government, which came in a year or so ago, is a coalition government, which is not, not, uh, not usual for the UK. But as you know, it took a, a series of very tough decisions very early on to reduce our um, budget deficit. Uh, because although out of the euro, we realized that um, we needed to restore our fiscal um, credibility if we weren't going to get attacked by the markets and by the ratings agencies uh, as well. So um, fortunately, um, the UK has not been as directly affected by the crisis elsewhere in the eurozone so far because I think the perception is that we took those early, uh, those early steps and our AAA rating has been con confirmed and so on. But we are... Um, uh, very concerned about the Eurozone uh, crisis. It's the most serious crisis by a long way that the Euro has, has had in its, uh, in its 10 years. Um, and um, um, in the case of Ireland, we've put in four billion pounds of our own money um, because of the extent to which the UK and Irish economies are interlinked, uh, in addition to what Ireland was getting from the IMF and from, uh, and from, the, uh, and from the Eurozone. And although our banks are not um, as directly so exposed in relation to, um, in relation to, uh, to Greece, the knock-on effect um, from German banks and French banks onto our own would be, would be very serious. So this is a very serious crisis. Um, as with everything in Europe, um, the economics is always overlaid by a lot of politics. Yeah. There's a huge amount of political investment in Europe in the success uh, of the euro. Um, and the critical judgments in the end will not be um, those of Greece and Portugal, or even maybe Spain, the critical judgments will be, will be in Paris and in Berlin as to whether this project is worth continuing to subsidize uh, and support. And I don't think we've yet reached a critical point uh, with that, although um, uh, you know, there are many economists around you know, who see this as a very, very fundamental crisis. Now, Europe is very inevitably, uh, as in this country, we're very preoccupied with our economies at the moment. You're looking inward in this country much more because of, because of the, uh, the financial crisis and the very slow recovery uh, from it and the problems over your infrastructure, energy policy, and so on. I understand that, um, that uh, higher degree of introspection, and the same in Europe. Um, we've had that for, pol for political reasons in Europe, trying to get our internal machinery right, and we've now got it with this enormous uh, Eurozone uh, crisis. I don't think it means that uh, Europe becomes unimportant internationally. Um, and particularly in, in, in relation to the Arab Spring, we're very, very c c 
close physically to those countries. Um, and at the theoretical level, at least, we ought to be able to play a positive magnetic role in relation to the countries of North Africa and elsewhere in the Middle East, similar to the role that Europe played in Central, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Now, we can't offer a country like, um, like Egypt um, European Union membership, but you can offer them um, the better trade and economic relationship, which essentially is, a, is an offer to them of greater prosperity right. um, in return for trade liberalization on our part if, they, if the reform um, continues. And I think that's what we want to be able to do, and that's the British view of our neighborhood policy EU um, to these uh, countries of the, uh, um, the um, North Africa and Mediterranean. We want to be able to use uh, our money helpfully. There's already about $1.1 billion worth of money available from Europe um, to help with the political reform and renewal process and the economic renewal. These are large sums of money which Europe has at its disposal. So Europe is struggles sometimes for unity, struggles sometimes to project itself effectively abroad, but is again not to be, not to be um, written out of the script just because of those, uh, those problems. Thank you. I have a hundred more questions. I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to ask them uh, because I want to turn it over to to all of you. I just wanted to say, you know, you don't get to be um, the foreign policy advisor of the British Prime Minister without a coherent, informed, very intelligent worldview. I think that's what we've just heard from our guests. So I want to thank Nigel for answering all of my questions, <laughs> at least some of them, and uh, and then turn it over to you. Aspen rules, the same rules we follow at Harvard University. Please identify yourself by name and make sure that at the end of your statement there's a question mark <laughs> attached to it. <laughs> Ambassador Burns. Stu. Two or three. This is the boat of excellence. <laughs> Europe, Europe says a uh, percentage of what they spend on for defense compared to the United States has been very really small. Uh, in Kosovo, in your own backyard, you were allowing uh, atrocities. The United States, under President Clinton, was the one that really made something happen and change there. Uh, with the economic crisis happening, it could be, I mean, the United States still has hundreds of uh, thousands of troops in Europe, which was there originally for the protection of Europe from the Soviet Union. The thought that we could be pulling troops back now. Is Europe going to stand up? Can they take care of themselves? And do you think, think Nick, that the United States would start pulling troops out? Of, I mean, we have more troops in Europe than anywhere else in the world. I will. I mean, my, my recollection of the 90s, Stuart, is a little bit different from yours. I thought that we were the ones pushing you to put ground forces into Kosovo, for example, uh, and you eventually did. Um, <laughs> but um, you said that. no, no, no. no. I, I, I think that you know, the 90s were a period where, um, uh, and this even, you know, th this applies also to the, um, to the, uh, you know, the Iraq uh, war to, to, um, in, in 91, where, um, where, where power was used but in quite a controlled and careful and limited and careful way. Um, and ultimately, you know, for the most part, pretty, pretty successfully, despite the horrors of Srebrenica and everything else, where we got into a sort of bind, expecting that the, you know, the, the UN was able to protect more than, uh, more than it could. But it was a sort of transitional phase that we were, um, that we were, that we were going through. Um, I, I'm sure that American you know, forces, the, the stationing of American forces in Europe will, will be reduced. We in the UK are not going to have any forces in Germany um, um, by the end of this decade. So I'm, that's a, if we're doing it, we can't possibly complain if, uh, if others start to do it too. I think for the most part, you're going to need staging posts um, in, uh, in Western Europe uh, and continue to for your military uh, intelli and intelligence operations uh, more broadly. Um, and you have a huge, you know, you have a series of huge bases in places like Italy and, Ger and, and Germany, mainly to be able to conduct operations in the Middle East and, uh, and Afghanistan rather than for the territorial uh, defense, um, defense of Europe. So, um, so I think the answer is yes, but there are, there are almost non-NATO, non-European specific reasons why um, those will continue. The last thing I just bring into the equation, I mean, I, I am, I, I'm a hard power person. I believe that if you're going to, you know, if, if you want to be um, serious, given the problems we have in the world, um, you need to have hard power in terms of 
in terms of your defense budget, your military, your capabilities, your intelligence, and so on, and your resilience. And those are important. But, um, but to be effective across the board, you also need soft power. And Europe puts much, much more into that than the United States. Um, our aid budget is very much greater. I don't know what the numbers are. They're maybe you know, um, many, many times greater um, than the aid budget of the United States. And that aid budget is, of course, under great threat at the moment uh, in, the, in the Congress. We use other types of soft power at least as effectively as you. The BBC um, you know, is a very potent actor, uh, not a government actor, but a potent actor in its own right um, in the Middle East, in Iran, in relation to the, um, to the, uh, to the Arab Spring as a source of, uh, as uh, of, uh, of objective information. Um, and the BBC website regularly gets tapped into um, in the vernacular services in those, in those areas. So I think that you have to do a bit of balancing of the two. It's not, an, it's not for me, a, um, a suggestion that, that should, we should take the pressure off our European partners in relation to uh, defense and the hard side of things. Stu, I have to say very briefly, um, before we go to the next question, uh, it's an important question for Americans because we now have some liberal Democrats and a lot of Tea Partiers saying that America should basically stay at home, pull up the drawbridges, and think that in isolation we can succeed in, in a glo highly globalized 21st century. We cannot succeed without our allies. And you and I served together in Europe um, in the last administration, and I'm convinced that we need more allies in the world. We can't be isolationist. We can't be unilateralist either. And it's through our European al alliance and our Asian alliance that I think we keep the peace in the next century. So I think it's a very important question for all of us to reflect on. Uh, Bob, yes. You've talked a bit about NATO and its funding problems and its infrastructure. But how do you see it evolving in the next five or six years? And, and how do you think it should evolve in the next five or six years? Two different questions. <laughs> Well, I hope it doesn't have a, um, a crisis of, um, uh, of identity. I mean, I think it, it, it depends a little bit on how, um, how Afghanistan feels um, um, in the middle of this decade once we've effected this security uh, transition. Um, I think with Afghanistan, for all the frustrations over the level of NATO, um, uh, of European NATO support for the, um, for the effort, um, it you could look at this in a glass half full or ha half empty way. We um, have a history in that part of the world and are used to fighting, for better or worse, um, uh, in, uh, in ver these very, very hard terrains. But um, in a way, it's remarkable that Denmark and um, Estonia and come with some of the countries of Central Europe are there at all. This is very, very far from their military uh, you know, experience and from their sort of gene pool. Um, and you, you, can take the, you can take the point of view that it's scandalous, there aren't more of them, and they don't have special forces like American special forces or British special forces. Or you can say, actually, it's a, uh, it's a remarkable thing that you've even got this number of, uh, number of countries there. So I, I hope that, that the policy that uh, the president, along with our government, have set in train of an intelligent transition uh, in Afghanistan, um, uh, a judicious drawdown, but accompanied by an increased emphasis on the political track and trying to see whether there is a, um, uh, an effort possible with the, with the Taliban to bring them into the political um, process. If that can, um, if that can be achieved um, and you have an al-Qaeda-free Afghanistan with a reasonably representative form of, form of government, I think NATO will come out of that with some, uh, with some uh, confidence. And uh, I think NATO is going to have to remain um, of course, it will have to have still the, the, the European defense angle to it. But I think it can play a role quietly in relation to the Middle East as well. And I think it can play, it continue to play a role with, its, um, with, its, uh, with Australia, with Japan and others, creating these very broad, um, in a way, it's sort of soft power uh, military relationships. Well, we've made an executive decision. We're going to extend this to 105 so we can have more people ask questions. And then we need to go over to the next panel after that. But Diana. So Nigel, would you share with us how, what channels do you use to seek to influence the U.S. government, whether it be the White House, the State Department, or DOD? And I want to raise a particular point. 
Britain has a very strong association with the Commonwealth. In the Commonwealth are both India and Pakistan. So for London, the tensions between and the knowledge of each is something that we've lived with since 1947. When the US government developed an AFPAC strategy, a very important country got left out. How did you seek to influence the US government to break up AFPAC and to look at the triangle of India, Afghanistan, and Pakistan? Well, there's a, there's a long question and um, a kind of complicated one. And, and, there's, and um, I suppose there are, there are, two, there are two ways of um, trying to answer it. The, f the first is a process answer. I mean, the way the, way the British government and the American government work, and maybe this is an area where we are unusual or special, is that um, we, we really do a sort of full court type of uh, approach on any big issue. So there will be no part of the US government which Brits will not be interacting with when we're trying to um, find out what's going on or, in or have an impact on what's going on. Um, there is a sort of intimacy between our foreign policy and um, national security and defense teams, which means that we, we talk a huge amount um, and, um, and with, I think, well Nick will tell me if I'm wrong, but I think with a candor which America doesn't have with many other, with many other uh, allies. So the process point is that it's across the board. We don't just say it's enough to go and talk to the White House or it's enough to go and see Under Secretary Burns at the State Department. You, because of the dispersal of power within the American system, uh, our judgment is you have to try with everyone, including the media, including the think tanks, and so on. On, on the what, on the content of, um, of policy, I think it was understandable that the policy was, um, was those two countries mentioned. I think it was right to associate them, although not to equate them, of course, because they are fundamentally different countries. Arguably, Pakistan, the greater strategic prize for both our countries over, um, over time. But actually, I found that throughout, throughout this period, going back to the Bush administration, and certainly during the period of the last two and a half years, that there's been quite considerable American receptiveness to, to our views on this area, because we, we do have no, not only a lot of historical expertise, but of course, we have very large Pakistani and Indian communities uh, in the UK, which add a certain contemporary richness to the understanding of what's, um, of what's going on. Um, and um, we've worked very closely together with the United States on India and Pakistan. Again, important to de-hyphenate. They, they were always looked at as a hyphenated um, uh, relationship, and they've been de-hyphenated correctly by both our governments uh, over the past uh, um, decade, not least given the huge strategic significance of India. Um, but we've worked together very closely with, um, with the US government on the India-Pakistan relationship. But a lot of that inevitably has to be done, given sensitivities on both sides, particularly Indian. It has to be done quietly um, and, uh, uh, and, behind, and behind the scenes. So uh, it was right, I think, for it not to be called um, uh, an AFPAC-IND um, uh, relationship, but to, ha but to, hand but to handle it a little bit, um, a little bit differently. I'm very sorry, we've got to bring this to a close. We have a last question. Yes, sir. If it's quick, yes. Two quick questions. Kale Weston, uh, what's the toughest official message both of you have had to deliver to your American or British counterpart behind closed doors, and how did you go about doing it? And maybe were you successful or not? <laughs> the second question is about the wars and what went wrong, and maybe I can follow up after the official session. Uh, how much political accountability has there actually been in our capitals over what went wrong, and maybe perhaps more importantly, how much should we expect, even though I think both of our countries have pretty much forgotten about both wars? Thank you. Thank you. The, 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 second, the second one in, um, in the UK is ongoing. I mean, we, we, we chose a different route in the UK on Iraq, which was to hold um, uh, a public inquiry, which is still going on and which hasn't reported yet. Um, and that's had evidence from uh, a huge number of people, my, myself included, and they will produce a definitive piece of work uh, later this year, probably later this year, um, on the British role um, in, uh, in Iraq. 
Um, and um, in terms of you know broad political accountability, this has been part of our this is part of our 2005 uh, election campaign. Uh, the the father of someone who was killed in Iraq stood against our prime minister in his own constituency. So so this has been so I think you know it, it's been a you know a, a very big area of public debate, and there'll be a sort of definitive statement um, uh, of what of what happened and what went right and what went wrong. Um, by an independent uh, panel in a little in a little while. Um, difficult to answer the the, the first one. I'd, I'd say, generically, um, one issue, one set of issues which it's been you know, difficult for us to deal with has been the um, the Guantanamo set of issues. Um, I had some involvement in uh, in that in uh, when I was at 10 Downing Street. Continue to have some involvement as am, um, as ambassador uh, here. Um, no disagreement about the broad thrust of counterterrorism policy, but um, but you know um, we we didn't agree with that um, with that technique um, of handling uh, of handling suspected terrorists, um, and uh, we had to devote a lot of time to bringing back to the UK um, the UK nationals who were uh, in uh, in Guantanamo initially, and also a number of people who weren't nationals but were but were, but had some residence qualification in the UK. One of whom. Um, is still actually in Guantanamo. We haven't got um, got him back yet. So those were very difficult discussions because it involved a judgment about the background of those people, how dangerous they were, whether they would go back onto the battlefield that term, um, and uh, um, but against a very clear policy on our side that Guantanamo um, should close, and we we definitely needed to get our own our own people back to the UK, um, uh, more or less regardless of their background. Bring it to a close. Thanks, Ambassador Sangwal. Well Thank done. Thank you. That was really good.